good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to those of you here in the Bullpen Theater. Also, welcome to those of you joining us on Facebook Live uh, for the latest in our continuing author series. Uh, we have just two author series events uh, remaining in this fast-moving uh, summer. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Bruce Marcus, and I work in the Education Department. And in a few moments, I'll be uh, sitting down with our guest today. Uh, his name is Howard Megdahl, and he has written this book, The Baseball Talmud, which uh, looks at pretty much every player that uh, we know who played in the major leagues, uh, who has been Jewish, uh, or who is Jewish, or was Jewish. This uh, is interesting, though, because the original version of this book came out in 2009. This is new as of 2022. And Howard actually did have to delete one player from the original book. He'll tell you about that, because uh, they found out the player, uh, while he was thought to be Jewish, actually was not. But there have been a lot of players who have been added to the book since it originally came out uh, back in 09. Let me give you a little background on Howard. He has uh, written for a number of publications, including uh, the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, the 538 website. Uh, he also has his own website uh, that really is devoted to uh, women's sports, so we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later on. But our primary topic of conversation today will be this book, The Baseball Talmud, the definitive position-by-position -position ranking of baseball's chosen players. Please join me in welcoming to the author series, Howard Megdal. Howard. Thank you, everyone. Bruce, thank you for that warm introduction. Josh, thank you for being here as well. Um, this is a place of great meaning to me. Um, I'm here today with my family, with my wife, my daughters, my mother and father. Um, I was first here uh, at the age of six in 1986. I have uh, pictures in front of Duke Snyder's plaque, and uh, I grew up with a keen understanding that understanding and knowing History is vital to understanding where we are at the moment and where we are going in the future. And for me, that's what this edition of the Baseball Talmud has meant. Uh, the first book I wrote back in 2009, and yes, we had Buddy Meyer uh, as the second baseman. He has been since removed from the book. Uh, the reason why is that Buddy Meyer uh, was said to be Jewish during his lifetime. He never uh, disputed that, and in fact, among other things, was, in, um, was inducted into the International Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. Even when he was inducted into the International Jewish Sports Hall of Fame, he did not uh, reject it. And it's a wonderful thing, as near as I can tell, for a very good reason. Uh, Buddy Meyer did not want to be seen as anti-Semitic. He did not want to be seen as someone uh, negatively disposed towards Jews. And so that makes him a hero in my eyes. Uh, he's, he's not in the book, but this is somebody with an understanding of identity and the way in which that resonates. And I think that's vital to when we think about the stories that we tell and how we tell them. Uh, when I wrote the first edition of Baseball Talmud, I was in my 20s. Uh, I grew up in a, a town called Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Um, a large Jewish population, and there was a real sense growing up that a lot of the battles over anti-Semitism were behind us. And uh, from the perspective as I'm writing post-Charlottesville, as I'm writing over the last couple of years, there was a feeling that that is not the case. That is not the case today, uh, writing in my 40s and writing in a country where we need to make clear that there are important Jewish stories. Uh, I don't think there's a more important connection between the Jewish life in America and America itself than baseball. And there has always been a connection between Jewish life in America and baseball. Uh, the very oldest person on record to have played professional baseball is a man named Nate Birkenstock. He is Jewish. At the age of 40, uh, the Philadelphia Athletics needed a team, or needed a right fielder for their team. He came out of retirement. He played. And so, you know, George Wright, you know, 
by contrast, is a spring chicken. He's two years younger than Nate Birkenstock, who is on record a Jewish player in the history of the game. So when people ask, what is the connection between Jews and baseball, and how long does it go back? The answer is, the connection is total, and it goes back to always, literally always. But of course, it is not ancient history, far from it. We had the most Jewish moment in World Series history in 2021. Uh, there were, in fact, four Jewish players. We were 40% of the way to a minion in 2021 <laughs> in the World Series, where we had Alex Bregman, we had Jock Peterson, we had Max Fried, and the one fewer people seem to get is Garrett Stubbs, who is, of course, uh, now the backup catcher on the Philadelphia Phillies. We had a moment in which Max Fried pitched the ball, Alex Bregman hit the ball, and it was caught by Jock Peterson. So an entirely Jewish play in the World Series from start to finish. And so that is, I think, vital to the way we think about the subject. And the subject is, what stories are we telling and how do we tell them? I mean, and Bruce mentioned this, but I, I, I am particularly drawn to the fact that this museum wants to get beyond the stories that we all know and to tell them in new and vital ways. Um, we are always drawn, I am always drawn in particular, to Diamond Dreams, uh, to the section of this hall, this growing section of this hall about women in baseball. And we live in a time where we have an understanding, like never before, about the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, which of course existed from 1943 to 1954. But we also live in a time of unprecedented opportunities for women in baseball happening right now. And so I would urge all of you not to miss the opportunity to tell those stories. I believe someday I will be here at an induction ceremony for Justine Siegel, a great trailblazer who created Baseball for All and has created a pipeline for women in baseball that extends from U8 right up through now the collegiate ranks. Uh, my daughter played in a U8 team for Baseball for All. And just last week at Boston College was the second ever collegiate combine for high school girls and women who are playing baseball. Not softball, which is a wonderful sport, but a different sport. But baseball, a sport that I think we all here can understand is first among them. I cover other sports, but the truth of the matter is, this is the one. This is the sport. And as a Jew here in America, knowing and understanding that connection, it does. It extends beyond just realm of history and year. It extends directly into the way baseball has brought Jews to America, and baseball has brought America to Jews. And so I, I want to take a few minutes and talk about that, because I think it really matters. Let's talk about Hank Greenberg, who is somebody who we obviously know was one of the greats. He was a Jewish Hall of Famer. He hit 331 career home runs. That vastly understates the type of player he was, in part because we lost four full seasons of Hank Greenberg to serving the country in World War II. And I will say that, and I know we mentioned this before, Greenberg has a certain cachet when it comes to wins above replacement. Uh, he's somewhere in the neighborhood of 55. He's right there with Sandy Koufax. However, in my book, and I, I mean that both in the literal book and just in my heart, Hank Greenberg gets extra credit for having defeated the Nazis. I think that in a Jewish baseball context, that is worth you know at least a few wins above replacement <laughs> in my view. But it would also have brought him up near the neighborhood of 500 home runs and you know if you go by something like OPS plus on base plus slugging normalized for lead and era Greenberg is somewhere in the neighborhood of 15th in the history of baseball so this is not just a Hall of Famer this is an inner circle Hall of Famer in terms of what he was able to do he was also somebody who despite his greatness moved positions moved from first base to left field to move on the defensive spectrum you almost never see and won an MVP by learning to play left field, by going out there. He was not fleet of foot, but he managed to make that conversion relatively late in his career for Rudy York, and uh, it helped Detroit uh, to greatness as a result of it. 
But let's talk about Hank Greenberg early. Hank Greenberg in the the waning days of the 1934 season, the Tigers and the Yankees are battling for supremacy in the American League. Hank Greenberg is an up and coming star, but is not yet the Greenberg of legend. And the Jewish high holidays, which fall on different times in the uh, in the American calendar each year, came in the waning days of that pennant race. Greenberg had a decision to make. What are you going to do? Are you going to play on Rosh Hashanah? Are you going to play on Yom Kippur? He made the decision to play on Rosh Hashanah with special dispensation from a rabbi, who I would have to assume was a big Tigers fan. <laughs> Hit two home runs, and they beat the Yankees two to one. Uh, ten days later, as is the custom, Greenberg did not play on Yom Kippur. The Tigers lost. But he did not get negative press. In fact, the front page of the Detroit Free Press, there was a poem written about him in solidarity. Think about what that meant for the Jewish people of Detroit at that time. Detroit was a town that was built by Henry Ford, as vicious an anti-Semite as there has been in this country. Somebody who published a book called The International Jew, which is simply the protocols of the elders of Zion refinished for an early 20th century crowd. Father Charles Codwin was doing weekly radio broadcasts in Royal Oak, Michigan, a suburb of Detroit, often anti-Semitic in nature. This was not the easiest place to be doing this, and he was doing it at a time that there had not been, there had been Jewish players, from Nate Birkenstock through, of course, Andy Cohen, who played for the Giants in the 1920s, for John McGraw, and many in between. But there had been not been a Jewish superstar and so Greenberg was taking on a mantle at a time that there were more Jews who had uh, immigrated to America than ever before and was representing us, was representing us. And that was why Hank Greenberg made that decision. Hank Greenberg decided not to play in Yom Kippur, not because he was a particularly religious Jew, he was not. Greenberg came to understand what he meant to the Jewish people and that was responded to in kind. Greenberg, by the late 1930s, said he felt like every time he was hitting a home run, he was hitting it against Hitler. And you can ask Jews of a certain age and, and, and do it, because we won't always have them here. And they will tell you what Greenberg meant to them growing up at that time in America. So you fast forward 30 years, and Sandy Koufax faced a similar question. Sandy Koufax resonated as a Jewish figure, as a pop culture icon here in America. And in 1965, at the height of his fame, faced the same question, Yom Kippur, game one of the 1965 World Series. Well, what does Koufax do? Koufax decides not to pitch. Koufax, a secular Jew, more than a religious Jew, once again, making that decision. Why? Because of us. Koufax understood what it meant when Greenberg did that, 31 years ahead of time. Koufax understood what it would mean to make that decision when he did so. It didn't hurt that Koufax went on to win game two, and then on short rest came back in game seven and pitched one of the most marvelous performances you'll ever see. Um, you should go to YouTube as soon as humanly possible. I, I honestly should pause and you should go look at it now, but there's... Uh, that game on YouTube in its entirety, called by the great Vin Scully, who I am deeply saddened that we lost this year. A great, a great man. Um, and he called it. He called this moment in Jewish baseball history, but baseball history. And Sandy Koufax, arguably the best Jewish player. Um, the origins of my book come back to whether it is Koufax or Greenberg. I had a sociology professor on my intramural softball team who argued strenuously, and it was Koufax. He was a Los Angeles kid who grew up in the era of Koufax and actually quit our team over an argument about it with my third baseman who insisted it was Greenberg. So that was the moment in which I said, all right, I know I'm obsessed with this, but it seems like there's an audience for uh, beyond just me as well. Um, but I want to fast forward with you another 36 years to 2001, and Sean Green, who uh, wrote a wonderful book in its own right called The Way of Baseball. Um, Green was 
chasing 50 home runs, one of a handful of people who would have ever done so, and the Dodgers and Giants were locked in a pennant race. Sean Green, once again, even though he was uh, repeatedly um, approached by Jewish mothers in the minor leagues who knew he was a Jewish baseball player and wanted to set him up with their daughters, <laughs> the story he related to me. Um, Green was not an especially religious Jew. Green faced this question of Yom Kippur in the latter days of the 2001 pennant race. And why did Green make this decision? He did it because of Greenberg, he did it because of Koufax, and he did it because he understood his role as a generational player in Jewish baseball. And so, again, the thing that strikes me is that Koufax found himself more directly tied to Jewish life in America than he did before. As did Greenberg, as did Sean Green, whose spiritual journey is fascinating in and of itself. And that says to me that not only are we, as the Jewish people, tied to baseball, but the players themselves become tied to Judaism thanks to us. And so there is that connection that I don't think is accidental. I don't think it is surprising, and I think it reflects the way in which baseball and Judaism are in many ways twins of one another in the way we connect to it, in the way that the history matters to us, in the way that research matters to us, in the way that arguments matter to us. What is the Talmud itself but a series of arguments, no different, different in topic perhaps, but no different in how vociferous they can be than the way we talk about baseball. And so this book means a lot to me for a lot of reasons, in the same way that this place means a lot to me, the way we went a long time ago, and we will be going to for, I hope, a long time, and you'll take your children too, and your, and your children's children, to be here, to be connected to it, um, that the National Baseball Hall of Fame matters in the way that our other tradition, Judaism, matters. And so we will continue that tradition, those traditions, together moving forward. And they will matter as long as we all think about them, as long as we all care about them. Um, I'm honored to be able to tie them together with you and for you. And I'm very excited to hear what questions you have for me. So without further ado, I'd love to uh, move to our interview portion. But thank you all for coming. And for all who are watching virtually, thank you for taking the time. I'm going to grill Howard for a little bit and then give you a chance to ask some questions also. You, you touched upon this briefly, Howard, but I want to talk about this a little more in depth. For those of us not as versed in the Jewish faith, tell us exactly what, what is the Talmud? So the Talmud is a series of discussions, uh, essentially between learned Jewish scholars, about the meaning of the Torah. And so it's, it, I, I guess the best way, to, it's like a companion handbook to it, uh, in order to understand and interpret and uh, try and uh, establish what it all means. And so very purposefully, why I wanted the book to have that title was I wanted it to be the start of a discussion. Uh, to me, there is nothing definitive about, you know, even something as simple as wins above replacement. Yeah. I think those are useful starting points for a conversation about uh, both players and their impact and, of course, their lives as well. Now, the Talmud, is it a, is it a set text or are scholars continuing to add to it? As I understand it, and, and my, my um, expertise is more on the baseball side than the Talmud <laughs> side. Um, so I will with that caveat. But I understand it, it, it is a set text. Yeah. yeah. Your book is not, though. It, it evolves. Well. <laughs> I'm sure there will be future editions as well. You did talk about Hank Greenberg. I'm curious about some of the bigotry that he faced. Do we know if it was anywhere near the level of a Jackie Robinson, a Larry Doby? Was it similar? What's your take on that? So we have what Greenberg himself has said, and Greenberg has said he's talked about it. He's spoken about the fact that there were teammates of his even who didn't uh, had never seen a Jew 
uh, when he went down to play in Beaumont, Texas, in the Texas League, prior to getting to the big leagues. Um, but we also know, and Greenberg has talked about it, two things. One, he said, I, I, I never knew what having your bed was until I saw what Jackie Robinson went through. But we also have a moment in Jewish history, and again, I think this goes back to the way in which we talk about the players, the way they um, came through for us. Uh, and that is Greenberg had a collision with Jackie Robinson during Robinson's rookie year, made a point of going over, helping him up, and talking to reporters after uh, that he's wishing him all the best. And Robinson spoke about this as well. And um, to uh, many Jews who were rooting for Jackie Robinson, it was an opportunity to be represented through who Hank Greenberg was as a person. Um, but in terms of his, the bigotry he faced, it's worth pointing out, and, and I've written about this, Greenberg in 1938 had a year that was great even by Hank Greenberg's standards. Hank Greenberg hit 58 home runs and was closing in on what was the, you know, the mythical already number of 60 hit by, by Babe Ruth in 1927. Uh, Greenberg's walk rate went up fairly considerably from April to August mm -hmm. into September. He was getting uh, fewer pitches to hit. And whether he would have broken the record if he had been uh, given as many strikes in September as he did in April through August, something we don't know. We do know it was unfortunate that he faced Bob Feller, who he struggled against throughout uh, Feller's career, a young Bob Feller, I should say, I believe his rookie year or thereabouts. And Feller struck out 18 hitters in what would have been Greenberg's final chance to do it in Cleveland uh, that day, Greenberg uh, among his victims. It is a wonderful historical Jewish footnote. Feller was the losing pitcher that day. The winning pitcher, a man in my book as well, Harry Eisenstadt. And Harry Eisenstadt actually outdueled him. It was a two to one victory for the Tigers. How about Sandy Koufax? He comes up in the late 50s, has those great years in the early 60s, mm -hmm. then has to retire because of arthritis in his arm. By then, was he still facing a lot of this? anti-Semitism, or had that started to fade? That's a complicated question. You know, of course, it's hard to pinpoint anti-Semitism. It is unfortunately something that is sometimes out of view and something that is difficult to prove definitively. Uh, what we can say on that front is a um, contemporary of his faced what is fairly indisputable anti-Semitism, and I write about this in the book, uh, an outfielder uh, named Norm Miller, mm -hmm. uh, an outfielder with uh, Houston, who had a manager named um, Harry Walker. Harry Walker, uh, the brother of Dixie Walker, one of the players who uh, was unwilling to play with Jackie Robinson. And apparently uh, some of the bigotry uh, rubbed off on his brother as well. Um, Norm was on his way to a stellar season in the late 1960s, uh, batting average well over 280. Uh, on base percentage of memory serves somewhere in the 370s, uh, playing a very strong defensive outfield. And, and it's worth noting, parenthetically, this is during a time where pitchers were ruling. And so those numbers, those are raw numbers, but Norm had an OPS plus of somewhere in the neighborhood of 130 at the time that his manager benched him, benched him for a full 18 days. He comes back, instead of being a regular player, he played uh, about half the games for the remainder of the season, mm. you know, hitting his rhythm and timing. And um, Norm was never really getting another opportunity to do that subsequently. Well, Norm becomes a radio personality, um, which he is to this day. And uh, a front office executive with Houston approached him years later and said, I think you ought to know why this happened. Harry once said to me, uh, I'm not going to let a Jew be a star on my team. And this is one of these stories where you go back and you say, all right, well, does the historical record, you sure you run into this all the time, does the historical record parallel to the memories of the time? Well, they do, you know, thanks to baseballreference.com. And, of course, Sean Foreman's going to be here one day, too, uh, with a plaque, I believe, as well. Um, I looked up Miller's 1969 yeah. Day by Days today. Yes. And, and there is a huge gap. And it's there, and you can see it. And so we have proof. How often does it happen? How frequently does it happen? Is it something that you wonder about? Do you face even to this day? You know, you talk to the current day players, they've heard comments here and there. Um, but I think, again, 
there is a parallel to Jewish life in America. Um, the comfort with which people are okay expressing it publicly, um, I think, has a lot to do with how easily you can hear it and identify it and understand it. There are three Hall of Fame players uh, who are Jewish. Koufax, Greenberg, obviously two of them. Mm -hmm. And if you ask that as a trivia question, a lot of people would stop right there. Uh, I had to be reminded of this the other day when I looked through your book. Mm -hmm. But there is a third, and he never gets talked about, Lou Boudreau. Why is he overlooked in this? Well, there's a few reasons, right? One is that Boudreau was not publicly Jewish during his lifetime. He had a Jewish mother, um, but he was not, in the way we talked about, the way I talked about up top, you know, Greenberg was a Jewish hero. Greenberg uh, self-identified. Uh, Koufax as well. Sean Green did this as well. Um, and that was not Boudreau. Um, but there are other reasons too, right? I mean, Boudreau was a star on these Cleveland teams, um, but most significantly in 1948. Um, and the 1948, you know, the Cleveland then Indians, now Guardians, of course, are a team that um, has in many ways been forgotten, I think, un unfortunately so, a team with so much star power, but to the extent it is remembered, there are other stars we tend to talk about first. I don't, I don't think that is fair. Um, I, the stats nerd in me particularly loves Lou Boudreau's 1948 season. This is somebody who hit 355 with 18 home runs and nine strikeouts all season while playing a gold glove level shortstop. Now, I say gold glove level because, as we know, the gold glove was not given out until 1957. And so to um, Gil Hodges, who won three gold gloves, and people talk about that as a reason to not vote him into the Hall of Fame. Well, they were, in fact, the first three gold gloves given out. Yeah. Gil Hodges would have won, you know, um, more like a Keith Hernandez or Bill Mazeroski level. And so I am delighted that the great historical wrong has been righted, and Gil Hodges is, in fact, in the Hall of Fame, but we were able to take pictures in front of that plaque, something I wasn't sure he would get to be able to do. Um, but Boudreau clearly would have been a gold glove shortstop. And, but my favorite stat is that 18 home runs and 98 walks, by the way, 98 walks to go with that 355 batting average against nine strikeouts. But my favorite part, he was the manager, too. <laughs> yeah. Just an incredible season. And uh, while Greenberg and Koufax are slightly ahead of Boudreau on my list among all-time Jewish players, I don't think there's been a greater season than either Boudreaux's 48 or Al Rosen's 1953. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about Rosen in a moment. I want to talk first, though, about Mo Berg. <laughs> Would you say he is the most colorful of all the Jewish players? I mean, might be the most colorful of all humans. I mean, <laughs> Mo Berg, somebody who did everything, right? Who went to law school, who studied the Sorbonne, who uh, was a spy for the OSS, the forerunner of today's CIA. and. By the way, in and during all of that, played Major League Baseball for many years. Was a panelist on the uh, on the radio show Information Please. Uh, if you make a list of dinner party guests, <laughs> I, I, I don't know how you put anyone ahead of Mo Berg. And I also believe, and and this is something I cannot prove, but I believe that Mo Berg, had he simply focused on baseball, would have been a potential great player. Let's not forget, Mo Berg, straight out of college, was able to play well enough to play for the Brooklyn Dodgers. Mo Berg, had he simply gone on to focus on baseball instead of doing, of course, everything, that Mo Berg may well have been a great. For you to be able to still play at the level, and let's be fair, at the level that included the phrase, good field, no hit, which it is said Casey Stengel came up with mm -hmm. about Mo Berg specifically. Uh, Moberg was still able to catch in the major leagues. Moberg was still able to uh, collect a large number of hits while he did so. Um, so Moberg perhaps would have been an even greater baseball player, but of course he had so much else to give to the world. Highly intelligent, spoke multiple languages, mm -hmm. did, as you say, essentially become a spy for the United States. And then later in life, I, I guess you could say maybe suffered from some mental illness. He was supposedly a hoarder. Mm -hmm. He uh, lived uh, basically rent-free with his sister. And then I think maybe at one point, um, uh, either she or his brother actually kicked him out because mm -hmm. it was not easy to live. <coughs> yeah, I mean, you know, clearly a challenging life. And, um, you know, somebody that 
perhaps the world did not know quite what to do with. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's that's the the sad takeaway I think that comes along with it for sure. You mentioned Al Rosen a moment ago, somewhat of a forgotten player. Yeah. But for a period of about seven years, dominant, one of the best third basemen in either league, mm -hmm. won the MVP award in 1953. The reason that we don't maybe talk about him all that much today is that his career was only 10 years, had to retire because of a back injury early. And let's not forget, he was curtailed at both ends. You know, you had the issue of the back. Um, there are a lot of parallels, actually, between Al Rosen's career and that of David Wright. Um, who was, if you go by uh, something like wins above replacement through age 28, David Wright is actually seventh all time when all third basemen to ever play the game. The six ahead of him are all Hall of Famers. Mm -hmm. So that was the track he was on. That's the track that Al Rosen would have been on were it not for back injuries that curtailed his career in his early 30s. But of course, Ken Keltner, who uh, to my mind is most famous because he is uh, immortalized in the song Jolton Joe DiMaggio as the one who made uh, several diving stops to keep uh, DiMaggio from getting to 57 games and halting his uh, uh, hitting streak at 56. But Ken Keltner was a great two-way player. Uh, Keltner, of course, was also the namesake for the famous Bill James test about who should be in this very building, uh, about who is a Hall of Famer. But Ken Keltner you know, again, you go back to the, that question of anti-Semitism, yeah. right? Um, was Al Rosen delayed because of questions of anti-Semitism from getting the opportunity? No reason to think so. Um, you compare that to somebody like Cy Block, who was a third baseman who played briefly with the Chicago Cubs in the 1940s. Cy Block was prevented from playing regularly. It was said that his manager um, did not think highly of Jews. However, Stan Hack, was an exceptional ball player, a third baseman, a terrific defensive player who actually did things very similar to what Cy Block did. He mm -hmm. hit about 10 home runs a year, 1,900 runs, kind of the Tommy Parr of his era, um, and was very much a player who was not easy to dislodge. Um, but as a result, for whatever reason, Ken Keltner is the third baseman for a period of time, and Al Rosen, I don't believe, got to play full time until he was 25 or 26. Yeah. Um, instead, tearing up AAA until he got there. And so, had he had those extra three or four years, maybe we're having a different conversation. One other thing about Rosen he became a very successful executive. Right. Was essentially the the Yankees general manager uh, succeeded under the reign of George Steinbrenner. Mm -hmm. uh, did very well, highly respected as a GM. Yeah, Rosen, no easy feat to do that with George, of course, and somebody who considered Hank Greenberg a mentor in a way that allowed there to be that Jewish baseball connection as well. But yeah, Rosen, um, a, a fascinating figure. So I'm probably overdue for a biography come back. Mm -hmm. I started following baseball in the early 70s. 1972 was the year I started collecting Topps baseball cards, so I have a lot of memories from there. The two Jewish players that I remember prominently when I started following the game, Mike Epstein and Ron Bloomberg. Let's talk about them. Yes. Mike Epstein was given the nickname Super Jew, which some people might say, oh, that's offensive, but he didn't think so. He liked it. He didn't think so. I certainly don't think so. I think it is, um, and I have a not informal list of best Jewish baseball nicknames. I've got it third. I'm open to <laughs> disagreement and discussion and sort of the start of it. Um, the second is the Hebrew hammer. Um, and we, but even better was the rabbi of SWAT. Um, that both belonged to Mo Solomon, who played briefly in the 1920s in the major leagues and had uh, 49 home runs playing for Class C Hutchinson, uh, the Wheat Shockers. Um, mm -hmm. A great nickname in and of itself. And number one, clearly, Number one for me is Barney Pelty's nickname, one of the great Jewish pitchers of the early 20th century. He was known as the Yiddish Herver, and uh, I think that is as good a nickname as they get. There is actually a Barney Pelty Way named after him in his hometown, but a real missed opportunity. It's a straightaway. Yeah. <laughs> you ever talked to my guest? I have not. I have not. I've talked to his son, who actually runs a baseball hitting clinic to this day that Epstein himself started. Yeah. You know, Epstein is one of these stories where you look at what he was in the late 1960s, and 
very clearly, if the designated hitter had been around, he would have established himself pretty fully at that time because there would have been 10 additional jobs for him to be able to hold down. And at that time, the DH was used primarily as its own job rather than what has become for a lot of teams today, which is just sort of a catch-all to rest different regulars. And so I think it's fair to wonder uh, what he would have done with regular time. Because certainly, Epstein, and again, you have to look at his numbers in context. So mid to late 1960s, a real pitcher's era, you know, obviously to the point they had to lower the mound after the 1968 season, uh, the year of the pitcher, when <clears throat> Paul Jaskinski led the AL in batting average at 301. Well, he did this at that time. You go by OPS Plus, you adjust for league and era and the parts in which he played, and Epstein was an absolutely superlative player. You know, he had some clashes with Ted Williams in Washington, mm -hmm. but when we had a chance to talk to him, he was part of our Jewish baseball weekend here back in 2004, mm -hmm. and he just praised Williams up and down for his hitting philosophy. And you mentioned the hitting school. It's at that hitting school where Epstein really promotes a lot of the Ted Williams concepts. It's a beautiful thing, again, the lineage of baseball history, the fact that there is an ability to connect to the past and to go far so far back I'm, you know the book i wrote the cardinals way um allowed me to do that in a fundamental way to be able to talk to red shandies uh, you know was of course rightly honored in these halls and red was in his 90s and he was still coming to the ballpark and he was still a trusted advisor to the manager to the coaching staff and he was not ceremonial um, but red of course had been signed by branch ricky yeah. Red had worked with uh, George Kissel, who had coached for 68 years in the Cardinals organization. So somebody who was directly hired by Branch Rickey was still somebody who had direct influence, and Red did as well, on people like Yadier Molina and Adam Wainwright, who were playing to this day. Yeah. And I just, I, I love when you see that type of connection from time to time. And again, yes, the Epstein continuing to work with hitters who you can find throughout, uh, you know, affiliated baseball to this day is a beautiful tribute to Ted Williams, though I will have to say Ted Williams serving on the Veterans Committee and not allowing Roy Campanella to cast a remote vote for Gil Hodges mm -hmm. delayed Gil Hodges being in these halls mm -hmm. for 30 years. Um, and so while we honor Ted Williams rightly so, um, we will never forgive. <laughs> I'm sure he'd be all right with that. If he on today. Uh, let's talk about Ron Bloomberg. Very different personality from Mike Epstein. Very outgoing guy. When he first came up with the Yankees in the late '60s, was heralded as this um, a great Jewish hope, if you will. Many Jewish people, of course, in the New York population. Here's what he said about playing for the Yankees: To be able to play in front of eight million Jews can't beat it. I lit everyone's candles for every bar mitzvah in the city. It was like I was related to everyone. They named a sandwich after me at the stage deli. That kind of sums up Ron Bloomberg. It does. I, it, he wrote a book. I'm so excited to share a publisher with him. Triumph Books. He's been wonderful. Um, published Designated Hebrew, and he has a second volume out as well. Um, but Bloomberg was somebody. Uh, Bloomberg was somebody who could have been a superstar were it not for injuries. You know, we think of him as a designated hitter, and rightly so. He was the literal first designated hitter. Um, as a lifelong National League fan, uh, I, I, I still say with some sadness that the designated hitter has come to the National League. But it also, I think, understates the type of athlete, the type of player that Ron was. He was recruited in multiple sports. He is somebody who could have played professional football. He potentially could have played professional basketball. He chose baseball, but injuries were his downfall. And so he was still, and you go back and you look, OPS plus well over 100. Somebody who was a clear hitter and a clear contributor to his teams. But I think a healthy run would have been somebody we talk about very clearly as among the Jewish greats. When I first met Ron, he visited here several years ago, and I asked him about his helmet, because I would see on TV or on his baseball cards, it looked like a little piece of tape on his helmet, and I would ask him about that. And I said, what was that? And he told me that was like a little piece of tape that had the Jewish star on it. I never realized that. I mean, again, there are ways in which being Jewish mattered to the fans, and then the fans mattered to him. 
right? I mean, again, you talk about going to a candlelight, and you talk about having a sandwich named after you. I, I dare say the fact that Ron is Jewish made him resonate more in that time. I mean, a great Jewish star in New York City is something that, to this day, we've never had. It's kind of the white whale when you think about Jewish baseball history. Andy Cohen, who I mentioned briefly, was somebody who John McGraw had signed with the hope that he would be in the 1920s. Uh, you know, uh, this is something that I often think about with Sandy Koufax. Sandy Koufax, um, you know, the Dodgers uh, ripped out of the heart of Brooklyn and um, taken to Los Angeles three years ahead of Sandy Koufax becoming a great pitcher in his own right. But imagining Koufax for the people of Brooklyn, uh, the 1954 Sporting News has one of my favorite facts talking about the fact that 50% of the season ticket holders at Ebbets Field were Jewish wow. in 1950. Right, 50%. It's amazing, mm -hmm. isn't it? And then you just think about what Colfax would have meant. A Colfax in his prime had Walter O'Malley not decided we're going to move 3,057 miles. If Walter O'Malley had simply accepted, I know Robert Moses, and we've had this argument, my father and I, for a long time, Robert Moses refused to let them build an Atlantic Yards where the Brooklyn Nets now play, where the New York Liberty now play at Barclays Center. Um, but had they simply accepted Flushing Meadows, uh, moved them a barrel away, we could have had the Brooklyn Dodgers in this same place to this day. And we would all be Brooklyn Dodger fans in my family. Uh, that would have been the way to do it. Yeah. And think about what Koufax would have meant in New York City at that time. It's remarkable. Speaking of left-handers, Ken Holtzman, when he came up, was compared unfairly yes. to Koufax. Although he was a very good pitcher for the Cubs, mm -hmm. big part of the A's run in the early 70s. Late in his career, goes to the Yankees. He's really on the downhill side. Had a lot of problems with Billy Martin. People yeah. have speculated for years that Billy treated him badly because he was anti-Semitic. Have you looked into that at all? It's not. It's one of these things, right, where you can't grasp it. You can't find something definitive. There's a concern, there's a suspicion. I think there is always that question in the minds of, uh, of Jews of when we are ill-treated, what is the reason for it? I do think Holtzman is a remarkable figure, though, in baseball history, and, uh, you know, was compared to Sammy Koufax. There's one loss record is a flawed stat, as we know, but, of course, Ken Holtzman has more victories than Sandy Koufax. He pitched many more games, but has the edge in terms of most wins by a Jewish pitcher. Um, something that I believe Max Fried will, in fact, potentially challenge him on if Max Fried stays healthy. But Max Fried also erased Ken Holtzman from the record books this past year. Uh, Ken Holtzman was until 2021 the answer to the trivia question, who was the last Jewish pitcher to record a win in the World Series? And it was Ken Holtzman in 1974. Wow. Now, of course, the answer is the same pitcher who has the most recent victory, period, regardless of religion. And that is Max Fried, who won the clinching game for the Atlanta Braves, unfortunately, mm -hmm. in 2021. And Fried had just a remarkable season start to finish. He was not only the winning pitcher in the championship game. Max Fried also won the gold glove mm -hmm. as a pitcher. And he did something that sadly will perhaps never be done again. He was the Silver Slugger winner yeah. as a pitcher in the National League in 2021 before the National League decided to move to the incorrect rules. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about some more recent players. Uh, a guy I think is underrated, mm -hmm. retired just a couple years ago, but really a standout player, Ian Kinsler. Yes, Ian Kinsler and a member of the Texas Rangers Hall of Fame uh, just a couple of months ago was inducted into that as well. But Kinsler, somebody who had power, speed, and an old love. He was somebody who came up as a shortstop and may well have stayed at shortstop and had a very successful time playing shortstop as well, but was an excellent multi-time Gold Glove Award winner with more than 200 home runs in his career, somebody who was a stolen base threat as well. What I love about Kinsler, of course, is that he was able to cap his career by playing for Team Israel. You know, Team Israel, I just have to say this, as somebody who's been obsessed with Jewish baseball for my entire career, it, it's like a baseball fantasy come to life. You know, where you're sitting there and you're making these teams of Jewish players like I did in the book, and you say, geez, I wonder what it would be like if they all play together. 
And now there's a team that does it because uh, Team Israel has all these American Jewish players who are doing so. Um, it's just such fun to see that we got to see Sean Green perform on that team in the latter stages of his career. And something I'm very excited about. And um, seeing Israel in the Olympics is something wonderful. Yeah. Um, you know, the Israeli baseball league is not yet taking off. I'm not somebody who believes that therefore um, it's not capable of taking off. I think we need to see more investment, we need to see more of it happen. But the fact that Team Israel offers us this opportunity to see these great Jewish players is something wonderful to me. Looking at today's players, mm. I'm going to put you on the spot here. Who do you think is the best of the Jewish players today? This is such a hard question. We have a similar challenge to the one we had when we talked about Greenberg versus Koufax. We are comparing Max Fried and Alex Bregman. Yeah. Alex Bregman, who is on track, I believe, and I put him ahead of Al Rosen among all-time third basemen, which is a very challenging thing to do. But Bregman, who is still in his 20s, is performing at such a level um, at both sides of the ball. Bregman's another one, by the way, converted shortstop, yeah. who is an elite defensive third baseman. But he is doing it all, having a great year for Houston, had a two-home run game just uh, the other day. But Max Fried is well on his way to challenging Holtzman, even if he's going to fall short in all likelihood of the peak of Sandy Koufax, as one of the most valuable Jewish pitchers we've ever seen. And so I, I, I hate to uh, not have an answer for you, but I think it's between these two at the moment as to who is the best Jewish player. I'm hard pressed to say who I would take. I really think it comes down to what you need more. If you, I guess you always need more pitching. But it's, that's a very difficult question to answer. But those two are the big challenges, I think. Well, they're so different. Pitcher, hitter, there's no reason you can't have both. I would like to have right them both. Yeah. And just to be clear, I have on, on multiple fantasy baseball teams. They are both on that team for me. Right. <laughs> we have a few minutes remaining with Howard Megdal. If you've got a question for Howard, raise your hand. I'll be happy to call on you. Where do you think we are now in terms of, of Jewish players, both in terms of the numbers that we're seeing but also in terms of uh, treatment uh, mm -hmm. from their teammates, fans. I is this still an issue? Is anti-Semitism still a concern for these players? Have we moved past it? Can we ever move past it? I'm not sure we ever can move past it. I think there are a large number of Jewish players, but I know there are, not only in the major leagues, but in the minor leagues as well, and great prospects from Hunter Bishop, who was in the San Francisco Giants system, to Zach Geloff, who is an infielder who is absolutely killing it since he moved up to double-A in the Oakland Athletic system. So Jewish players have, always will be, here to stay. I think baseball is, in the, is a reflection of American life. And to the extent we've seen um, disconcerting levels of rise in anti-Semitic hate crimes, I don't think we would be, I think we would be naive to assume yeah. that we can move to a world past that, even within the, um, the ball fields of baseball. Um, I, I think what we need to do, and what I would call on all of you to do who are watching and who are with us, is to proudly tell Jewish stories. Um, and this book is something that is a labor of love, as I, I guess you can tell, um, but it's something that I think matters. I think it is vital that we are raising our voices about Jewish baseball history, about Jewish stories writ large. And I think that's something that we need to do in everyday American life. And I think baseball is no different. Um, my bias, of course, toward this game, toward this vital game, is that we do it here. But I think we need to do that at every turn. We need to be sure that we are giving voice to the Jewish people because uh, we need allies to do it and we need to do it ourselves. In addition to obvious interest in Jewish baseball players today, but also historically, you're also very much interested in women's athletics, uh, not necessarily just in baseball and softball, but in other areas like basketball. You were telling me you have two different websites mm -hmm. that you run. Tell us about specifically what goes on there. Sure. The next is a women's basketball newsroom. Um, we have a staff of well over 30 people. We cover the next. The next. Yeah. N-E-X-T. Yeah, thenexthoops.com is the way to reach it. Okay. And um, we have uh, people covering all 12 WNBA teams. Uh, we are 24-7, 365 about women's basketball. Um, everyone from 
uh, if we use the Jewish context, Sue Bird of Syosset, to Lila Grubman, a freshman point guard heading to Yale University, also from Syosset, coincidentally enough. And so we tell, but these are stories about women's basketball writ large, making sure that in a landscape where only 4% of the media coverage is about women's sports, that there are places where you can see women's sports covered with the same urgency as men's sports. And the nine, uh, T-H-E-I-X-Sports.com, is where you can go across six different women's sports. Uh, we have a daily newsletter on soccer, tennis, basketball, golf, hockey, and gymnastics, six different women's sports. And I do a lot of covering of women's baseball as well. Um, the fact that there was a women's college combine at Boston College, that we are seeing players who are rising in this sport because they are getting the reps, they are getting the opportunity to play in women's baseball today will matter for the future. And I am absolutely convinced that there will be women in the Baseball Hall of Fame as there will be women playing Major League Baseball someday. The nine you mentioned, yeah. uh, what, the nine.com? The, the, the nine sports, so T H E I X sports. The nine is in Title Nine, title which nine. we celebrated the 50th anniversary of this past year. So that's the other site that you're uh, heavily involved with. I don't know how you have time to do it all, but somehow <laughs> you do. Uh, Howard Megdahl, the author of the Baseball Talmud, the definitive position by position ranking of baseball's chosen players. Uh, we're going to head outside into, uh, not into Cooper Park, but into the atrium here. And there, Howard will be available to sign copies of the book. He can personalize them in any way. I know I'm going to get a book signed for the Hall of Fame. The book is available for purchase in our bookstore, which is right uh, outside the door as well. Howard, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Howard Mendel, author of the Baseball Talmud. Please join us in the library atrium. Thanks, everybody. Very good.